Good evening. Welcome once again to Wednesday Night Bible Study there at Good News Church, where we are studying the book of Romans. As we would like to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We pray that you pray that you had a blessed day that uh, has been full of the blessings of the Lord. And yes, even the struggles that you stopped and the Bible tells us to count it all joy when we go through diverse temptations and struggles. And one of the things that uh, I'm just, it's been on my lips here lately, is that the Bible says that God inhabit the praises of his people. If you can't do anything else, you can just think of what God has done just to wake you up this morning. Give him praise. Give him praise for who he is, what he has done. We praise him for his son, Jesus Christ. Praise him for the Holy Spirit. Praise him for his word. Praise him that, you know, you and I have a, a, a right now to just come assuredly and boldly to the throne of grace. One of the things, that before we even get in our study tonight, just kind of just a way of encouragement for those. As we say, we know that uh, next week is election week next Tuesday. All over United States, we have a midterm election that we will be electing for mayors and propositions and uh, those in the council and uh, whether what seat will be what. So um, not even, even saying what political party you're in, but one of the things I like to say to us as Afro-American people, or you just want to call it black, is that it's a privilege that we don't want to pass over. Do we have those who sacrifice their lives and time uh, of all kinds of struggles that we'll be able to vote? So don't look, take it lightly. I know we have a new, the new generation, they say millennials and different things think is not necessary to vote. But we as a people realize that even though you think that your vote doesn't count, you have that peace to realize that you did do something that um, helped change. And if it didn't, you, if your proposition don't work, your mayor don't get in there, or the thing that you didn't want to have, at least you did not, because we're saying that a uh, no vote to me is a yes vote for what you don't want. So uh, I would say make sure you go out and vote. If you haven't registered to vote, it's not too late, because still got a little bit less than six days to go in there. But if you have, go out and vote and make your name known. Okay, without further ado, let's get right into it. And then we get into the word we want to pray. For those that we said on last week that we know that um, one of our sisters of our church, that the Lord has put it on our heart to uh, call a time of prayer from uh, 6 to 6.30 every Friday. We'll be doing this until the new year. And we ask that those, if you can fast and pray during that time, or just put aside a meal and to spend that time in God's Word and praying. This year, this week, we are praying for the youth. The youth all over. Youth in our family, youth in our churches, youth in our schools. That first of all, for God can save them, for God can keep them, and that they would be delivered from the enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy. So we want you to do that, and that's for this Wednesday. Amen. For without further ado, let's get right into the Word of God and pray. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, tonight with Lord, we just come just to say thank you and to praise you for once again, for an allow us to come into your presence, Father, not on our own righteousness, but the righteousness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Realizing, O oh God, when you're asking that you would fill us with your Spirit, Lord, that even as we get ready to get into your Word, Father, that you help us grow and in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to pray for, for Lord, we want to pray Father, for this time of election, Father, time, Lord, that we'll be able, Lord, to um, put our vote out there, Lord. We pray for the families. We pray for our president. We pray, Father, for our government. We pray for our churches, Lord. And, Lord, that with those that we know, oh God, that are struggling with this cancer, we pray, oh God, your divine healing upon them. You said in your word, by your stripes, we are healed. We know you heal us physically and you heal us spiritually, Lord. So we ask you, let thy will be done. And you said, whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth will loose in heaven. You've given us that authority, Father, to uh, pray for those and have uh, ask for, for brothers to lead them to a knowledge of you to get forgiveness, oh God. So help us tonight as we get in your word. Tonight, as we get in there, Lord, we ask that you would help me, Father, to not speak of myself, but to speak of the oracles of God. Where I'm weak, strengthen me. Where I'm strong, humble me, Father, realizing that all I can do is what you call me to do. We ask these blessings in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Once again, we're in the book of Romans. And remember that we've been in Romans for the last month or so over. And we will be walking through this book of Romans to calling all of us here. We're 
been finished the first chapter. Actually, tonight we'll finish the last few verses of uh, the first chapter. We we'll go into the second chapter. But remember that Paul in the first chapter talked about, give us an introduction of that, tell us about the gospel and the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we know the gospel is Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is the good news of the gospel. Then Paul, in that from 7 to verse 16, he tells us and gives us his personal testimony of faithful service to the Lord and how that uh, he uses his own. If you read that, you find out what it takes to be faithful in God. Uh, that you have a concerned spirit for others, that you have a faithful spirit, a spirit of obedience, a spirit of um, sensitivity to the, the things that are, and the people that are lost. And then and we talked about in the last section, which we talked about was the wrath of God. And uh, we're going to get into that tonight, but the scriptures that we're going to have tonight, we're going to talk about where we left off at. Here is Romans uh, 1, verses uh, 28 through 32, which is the latter verses of the talking about the wrath of God. So as we have it here tonight to talk about the wrath of God, let us read these verses before us. Romans 1, verses 28 through 32. And it reads, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, and whispering, backbiting, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, without the understanding, covenant breaker, without natural affections, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the, do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, let me say this before I even get into this here. We notice that we said, now the things that we talked about here all brings about what? The wrath of God. Remember we talked about on last week, we talked about how that God gave them over and said men with men and women done things that a natural, natural use of women, which we know are homosexuality. And then it said they that knew God didn't want to glorify God, but they worshiped the creature more than the creator, which means that people were more into the things of God and the, of God. So and about them, the wrath of God comes upon them. But here, but we, a lot of times we pause on that and we're still thinking about the homosexuality. We think about what the uh, men with men and women with women and all these different things here and the wrath of God. But let me go on back there. But as we think about that, we say, oh, that's a work sinner. But I'm going to tell you something. Uh, Dr. McGee calls these people reckless sinners. But I'm going to go back and I want to see some, say some things here. Now read here. These were things here that brings about the wrath of God. If you, you may not be in a homosexual. You may not be an adulteress. But here, you may have done up these things here. These people here, they have a reckless lifestyle. He said they are filled with what? All unrighteousness, anything that is pleasing to God. Fornication, which means pornea, pornography, and all those things. Wickedness. People are wicked who are evil, who just want to hurt people, who are just wicked in nature. Covetedness. People who are jealousy and want their, everything they see they want. Keep up with the Joneses. Maliciousness and full of envy. Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, and even... As they did not retain God in their knowledge, that God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And the reason why I wanted to bring those out is because those are the things that bring about the wrath of God. Amen? So I know that we won't say, well, I don't do those things. But look here, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers. That means you're saying one thing, doing another, without natural affections implacable, unmerciful, and who knowing the judgment of God, they that which commit such things are worthy to death. That means all those people that do those things, living that reckless lifestyle, these things are worthy of death. Not only do they do the same, they do the same, but have pleasure in them. In other words, there's people, they say, it's okay. So it brings about the wrath of God. So, but now, we're going to talk about it. Now, men... Here, remember we talked about man and they, they was in self-indulgent and they were uh, doing their own thing here. 
But now we're going to talk about man impotence. It means that even though they knew God, they didn't want to repent. And I picked this picture here because it shows the heart. A lot of times we think that people, all those lists of things that we talked about that were going on, these regular people were doing, homosexuality, backbiter, jealousy, envy, and all those different things. We think it's the deed that is. But it's not the problem. The problem is the where? The heart. And that's the reason why I chose this picture, because where it's impetus in the heart. People, heart, they don't want to change. They like what they do. And I'm going to tell you, God said, if you want to do it, it's okay. You know, I had to learn this, that, you know, we can't stop people from doing what they want to do. Only God can. So we have man's impotence. And we find here, when it call comes in here, it says here, what does that mean? It means not feeling shame or regret about one's affections and attitude. In other words, all these things that I just read out that people do, there's no shame about it. There's no shame about being a liar. There's no shame about being a hypocrite or being jealous or being covetousness or all the backbiting and talking about people, putting others down. People don't have no repentant heart. Then it says the symptom of they were, they were unrepentant, uncontrite, no remorse. They hurt people and don't care. That's the reason why they're evil, unashamed, unapologetic for when they do something. I mean, unbashful. They, they've hardened their heart. And that's what we see here. People that are doing this, and Dr. McGee made it right. They live a reckless life, and they don't care who they hurt or what they're they doing, what they do. But the passage we're going to talk about tonight is here. It's one word that, when it says that he gave him up, and I'm going to go back to you and show you what he says here in verse 28. Verse 28 here is the key word. He said, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. In other words, they knew God, but they didn't want to retain. They didn't want to uh, be held accountable to what God's word says. But look, God says, okay. And here's what the key that I want to get you to. Why people are doing what they're doing, whether in the church, outside the church, saved or unsaved. Why people do what they do, it says here. And they like it doesn't have no shame about it. Here it is. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. In other words, this one word, the reprobate, the reprobate mind, or some uh, version said the depraved mind is a term that means, comes from the meaning of testing something. And is used in the Old Testament to refer to metal that when it was rejected by the refiner because of the impurities, it was classified when a uh, uh, Refiner would get some metal and he would take it to the purifier, but it had some things that impropriety was. It was classified as worthless and useless. So to be rep, have a reprobate mind means God has given you up to be worthless and you are useless. Useless to him and even useless to yourself. Amen. So this is what I want to say. That's the reason why people are doing it. Hey, you can do what you want to do. You, you want to live a life of thievery, of, of fornication, and lying, and thieving, and homosexuality, and uh, all these different things you want? That, uh, it's okay. God says that's what you want to do. It's your choice. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, my thing is to tell you, if you're at that place, God loves you. And he died on the cross, so you don't have to have a reprobate mind. But if you reject him, this is where you're going to go. Amen. And he used here, Jeremiah used this term speaking of an unbeliever. And how that lets you know if a person with a reprobate mind, a Christian can't have a reprobate mind. That's all I'm trying to say here. If you have a reprobate mind, you're youthless because as a Christian, we have the Holy Spirit. He may, and the Holy Spirit in you, you fall into sin, it may be grieved, it may be quenched, but it's in you. But to have a reprobate mind means you don't know God. And how do you know it? Let's go to Jeremiah and what Jeremiah said here in the verse. That we have before us. Let me go to here. When it talks about here, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 6 and 30. It says here, using the word reprobate. Remember what we said? Youthless and worthless, right? Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord has rejected them. This is what he called unbelievers. This is the Old Testament. And up an unbeliever was called what? A reprobate. So if a person that live in this kind of lifestyle, doing these kind of things here, you are a what? Reprobate. And if you're a reprobate, mean that you are worthless and useless and you are an unbeliever. Amen? So here, that this brings to mind that when God rejects a person, they can do their own thing. 
That's the reason why we find people doing We get all uh, angry because of what people are doing out there. I, you know, it hurts me when I see uh, murder and rape and all the things that are going on in society. But I see a sinner doing what sinners do. They sin. Amen? And but the thing about it, it bothers me when you see a person who knows Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior and they live in such lifestyle. Then I have a problem with that. Amen. And, and God will bring us in judgment. We're subject to, to the, uh, the discipline of the Lord, just like those are disciplined by the wrath of God. Look what Job says in here. Job's dealing with this group of people. In Job uh, 21, verses 14 and 15, still talking about these people reprobate, that are living this reckless lifestyle. They're doing what they want, saying what they want, going what they want, treating people where they want. It's just like, it, hey, it's all said, if you're doing good, if, uh, do it. If it feels good, do it. You know, if the people, and this is, I believe this is where we are today. This is a society today. People are doing everything. Right is being called wrong and wrong is being called right. But Job had it right. He said, therefore, they said unto God. This is the people. God was reaching out to them. And Job said, this is what people, how bold people are that reject God. They get to the point and said, they said unto God, depart from us. Job, and remember his friends were telling him, and he was telling them about God. But he, the, the wicked people said, depart from us, telling God, get away from us. For we desire not knowledge of thy way. We don't know what, we don't want to know what your word says. We don't want to know what your commandments be. And there are people that day. I've talked to the people, don't tell me what the Bible says. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, here, this, you're not the only one. There are people like that. People have a reprobate mind. That's why they treat the word of God. There is no fear of God, reverence for God. But he said here, in verse 15, what is the Almighty? They question him that we should serve him. Ain't that bold? That's people that say, why, why should I accept Jesus Christ in my life? Why don't I go to the church? Why am I going to be a Christian? This is basically what it's saying. And what profit should we have if we pray unto him? In other words, it ain't going to help us. That's very arrogant. This is a strong word towards the Lord. This is what it's saying here. People that have a reprobate mind and when they're doing what they're doing, living the life they do. And some of them we have in our families who they say they know God, but yet they live in any kind of life, doing anything, think God's going to accept them. I'm going to tell you, based into the word of God, they reprobate. They're unbelievers. Amen. This, this is just straight out of scripture. I'm not going to try to uh, put you into heaven if you ain't going, if you don't know God. Because he said, if you do these things here. And you have knowledge of God, but you keep doing on them and you're doing what you want to do. The scripture is clear that you have a reprobate mind. You are unworthy and you're useless to God. I know that strong language and people that tell me, especially a liberal, say, what kind of God would be so unloving? A God who is just. A loving God will that because if he loves you, he will discipline you. So what well, here is the Lord gave them over to do whatever they want. But they will receive the consequences of their sin. So you're here, whether you're a reckless sinner, respectable sinner, or just a sinner, we all, the Bible said, all have sinned. And all shall come short of the glory of God. And if we don't come to Jesus Christ, it says, for all have sinned, we say, for the wages of sin is what? Death. And that death there is separation from God. Which Adam did, and all of us are born in sin and shaping in iniquity. Without Christ, if you, if you never accept Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us over in John, because we John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, right? That whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? It's when we love birth, John 3.16. But what does John 17 says here? But he that believeth not is what? It's condemned already. He said, I didn't come to condemn the world, it, you know, but that the world may be saved. But if you reject him, you already condemn. So this right, he says, so if you, they got it right. So what he's saying here, God gives up. You can do what you want. There's a consequences for your sin. This goes, and the list can goes on for sins that they will do and have pleasure in those who do them. It can go on. It's people that they don't do them, but they like to see them, them doing. Amen. But it don't stop there. Jesus had a word, and I, I, I read for you and quoted to you John 3, 16, and then the 17, but look what it says in 18. This is Jesus talking to uh, his disciple. John's, in John's gospel, it says here, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. And who is that light? The world turns up. Jesus is the what? The light. Amen? Jesus is the light. And this is why light came into the world. 
and said, men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. People don't want to come out. They, the reason why they don't want to come to Christ because they don't want their, what they're doing in the dark. They don't want their evil deeds to be seen. But look what he said. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Amen. You don't want to be around Jesus Christ. You don't want to come in church. You don't want to learn the Bible. It's because one of the reasons maybe if you've got a reprobate mind or you just, your deeds are evil. You don't want to come to the light. And said, neither come to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. You be convicted. So, what we're talking about, those were reckless sinners. And, you know, and you go back and you read that list again there in verses, from verses, um, I think it was 23 to 28 there, and you hear all those sins of that. You can go back to all those, not only the homosexuality, those who worship the creature more than the creator, and those who are backbiters and jealousy, those are reckless sinners. Those are people who's living a life of just total rebellion is good God, right? And then we'll sit there. But this next group of people that Paul liked to deal with are those, you know, you know how people say, well, I'm glad I ain't like that. I ain't no homosexual. I'm not this and I'm not that. But you're still a sinner. Amen. And this is what Paul is in here. And this is what he's trying to bring home to these Jews that were there is that whether you are reckless in your lifestyle or you're a respectable sinner. And he deal with that. So I'm not going to read these verses, but as we go to each one, I will talk about them. So, so what we find here is that when he talks about those, he turns to those who are from rejected gods who are living a total life of rebellion for who he is. And that's what people erect this life. They don't care about God. They just do what they want. And God says, okay, that's what you want to do. It's fine with me. Go ahead. That's the reason why we see, you know, we looked at Halloween yesterday and all those things were going on the other day at Halloween and people running around, all kind of lives are going. God has given them up to a what? A reprobate mind. Amen. But there's another people they were talking about. They're respectable sinners. They not be as bad as, uh, they were. these are the ones that say, I'm glad I'm not like him. But just because you don't like him and you bring in judgment on him, make you a guilty sinner too. You are what you call, Dr. McGee calls, a respectable sinner. Amen. And it goes on, it says here, here are the six, in, in these verses that we talked about, there are six principles that God will judge all sinful men, whether you are a reckless sinner, like we find in verses uh, 18 all the way to 30, uh, 38, uh, 28 in the first chapter, or is, we talk about the ones we talked about from 1 through 16, a respectable sinner. They, what we all have in common, they're all sinners. Amen? So here, so there's a knowledge, the truth, Guilt, deeds, impartiality, and motive. These six things here that we see here, he's dealing with here. So no matter what, you, you, you can be deal with, you can be held accountable to the knowledge, the truth, the guilt, the deeds, impartiality, and motive. You may not be as reckless, but if you got these kind of here, you're going to be held accountable. So the very first one we talked about is knowledge. You're going to be held accountable to the knowledge that you have of God. And see, one of the things about these Jews that were saved that was in Rome... They thought they, because they, and those who wasn't saved, uh, was in the uh, Roman church, they thought their heritage, because they were Jew, they were going in, they were uh, descendants of Abraham, that they were going to heaven. It's just like people think, baby, but I was brought up in the church. You know, mama brought me to church, made me go to church. I was baptized and all these different things. Those things don't put you in heaven. Amen. You still need to come to faith. Uh, and put your faith and the trust in what? Jesus Christ being the Son of God. That he died on the cross doing no sin for your sins and mine. That he was buried. That on the third day he rose from the grave. And that he ascended to the Father and he's at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for you. You come to the point and you realize and said that, you know, I want to repent of that and I want him in my Lord and Savior. Then you are saved. But you're going to still be held accountable to what? To the knowledge that you have there. So that's what we have here. So this is what he said. So you may not be reckless and living a life, and, but you're sitting there and you're judging folks. Or, or I, I, I like this one right here. When people say, you know, there's certain people, they look out the window. They're looking at them folks. Oh, look at them folks doing out here. But well, I'm glad I ain't like that. Look at him. Look at her. I don't know why she's doing that, right? Well, here, you're going to be held accountable. To the knowledge you have. You may not be reckless, but you're what you call a respectable sinner. You're doing sins, but you ain't doing it where everybody else sin. But God knows. And this is what that verse said. So the second chapter, verse 2 
in verse 1, that verse, Paul says here, and I like this because he said, therefore, and we always like to give, and I know we've all heard that, what is therefore, therefore, therefore is a connecting word. So he said, therefore, since all those that we just talked about are that reckless life and the things that they do, they're going to experience the wrath of God. Why? Because they're reckless sinners and they didn't care about God. But he says in here, you may not be doing the things they do, but he says here, therefore, which means, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou that judges another. In other words, you without excuse. You may not be doing what they're doing. Amen. But if you judge it on them, he said, you're going to be judged yourself. And I know we heard or the world like to say that. Back, Don't judge me. God ain't done with me. He's not done with all of us. None of us. But if you had come to Jesus Christ, yes, he is done with you. Now, your sanctification or your working out and making you holy is a work in progress. But yet Christ has done his finished work. He died once for sin. Amen. He don't go on the cross and keep going back. You, you sin. Oh, I got to go back and repent of it. No, God died once for your sin. He paid the price for it. And you ought to be living a life of worship. But he said, but, but yet you sitting in judgment on somebody else. He said, but therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou that judges another, for wherein thou judges another, thou condemnest thyself. For the same, for thou that judges doeth the same thing. So what he's saying, you're deserving the same thing in the judgment of God. That's the reason why I come here. And here's what his five up. He goes right back to what Paul started off in this first chapter and says here. Why all of it, whether you're a reckless sinner, whether you are a respectable sinner or a religious sinner, we all in common, we are sinners. And here's what here, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In other words, and when you and I are without Christ, we're living an ungodly life and an unrighteous life. He said, and we hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, we know God, but yet we don't change. We continue to live in sin. You're going to hold the count of that. Oh, yeah, you may not be out there doing some of those things that people, other folks, doing out there killing folks and raping folks and, and uh, all those things that we would say, oh, how worse it is, but yet you're sitting there bringing judgment on them. He said, you are inexcusable, right? But look what he says. He goes on and said, because thou, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. In other words, you know what's right and wrong, but you're not doing it. But he says, for the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let me pause and say this here. Brothers and sisters, that hear that we did, when you walk outside, you know there is a God. You see the sun sitting out there. If you look at it too long, you can get blinded. The moon out there, there's time that when it eclipses, you see how that when uh, it eclipses out there, you can't see it, and but yet it's halfway. All the, those things that we see for God. You sit out there, you see the Milky Way, the stars, and or you see trees that have been blossoming, the, it rain and storms, all that. It lets us know there is a God. But yet you don't want to acknowledge God, but yet you want to continue to live in sin and do what you want. He said, so that you're without excuse. That's, he just made it plain. You are without his guilt. And this is here where the rubber meets the road with these Jews that Paul was writing to in the Rome. They thought just because of uh, they not sinning like the others, that, and they, since they was a Jew, they were going on because of Abraham. No. And just because mama and daddy was a deacon and, and mama was a preacher and you broke up in church, you still got to accept Jesus Christ for yourself. Amen. You, I know we don't like that and say, well, I baptize. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism is what you do because you are saved to identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? So let me go on. So what he said, and so I like the word what he used here, inexcusable, which meaning there is no excuse at all. It does not matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. Gentile. You have no right to put yourself above anybody else, to put yourself in judgment, thinking you're better or putting down other folks. The same judgments you bring on others, you bring it on yourself. He said, and especially the Jews, because they had the knowledge of God, Jesus in that day. 
They, as a matter of fact, much is given what? Much is required. They have no excuse. What? But they, they actually rejected him. Those same people, remember on the day of um, Palm Sunday, they were saying Hosanna to the highest, praising God, Hosanna. They had palm branches. Those same people that were praising him all day in there. And uh, his disciples told him, tell him, won't you tell him to quiet down? He said, if these don't praise me, the rocks will quiet out. Well, these same folks on Friday said, crucify him. Amen. See? So you got to watch the people. Same people praising their day be the same one. Tell them, send them, send them to jail tomorrow. But these are people who don't know God. Amen. And this, this is what he would say to them and to you and I. As a matter of fact, we should be held more accountable for what we know. And we are. So here, in the book of Hebrews, the writer, which we, most people think it was Apostle Paul, writing the Hebrew book. And you know that because some of his writings, some of the wordings he used is so uh, fluent throughout the book of Hebrew that you can find in his writings, whether it was in Romans or there, just like this context here. So this is what happened in the uh, uh, Hebrew uh, church there. There were Jews who were falling back, wanted to, to Judaism. And then there were those who just like hanging out with the Christians that was in the church. They wasn't saved, but and they were trying to pull those back into Judaism. So, what he said here, so the writer here was trying to encourage them. And his, in this passage of scripture in his 10th chapter, he actually gives them some ultimatum and tell them, when you awfully reject God, this is what you're doing. He said, for if we sin willfully, that means after you have known the truth, experienced and seen what God has done, if you sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Right. You know the truth. You've heard it. You've seen it. But yet you want to continue. He said, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. In other words, you make it a mockery out of what Christ have done. So now who is he talking to here? It has to be unsaved folks. Amen. Because we know if he said, if we sin, we have a what? An advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So who is he talking about? These are these depraved people. Who sin willfully, they know the truth, but they don't acknowledge the truth. They matter of fact, they say they want to continue to do it all. Matter of fact, they have pleasure in people who are doing them. They are reprobate mind. He said they remain in no sin. Then he didn't stop there. Look what he says here. He continues on. He said, But a certain fearful looking for uh, of judgment and fiery indignation to those what? Talking about the what? The wrath of God. The judgment of God. Because you willfully sin knowing the truth. Now, let me say this here because I don't want to lead anybody astray and figure, well, you know what I mean? If I sin willfully, sometimes as a believer, you may have been saved uh, a week, you've been saved 10 years, but until we leave here, you're going to be struggling with the sin in the flesh. Christ took care of the penalty of sin and the power of sin. But the presence of sin is not going to be done away until we leave here. Amen. Because you were born in sin, right? And so we're in this sinful body. You're going to be struggling with some kind of sinful inclination until Christ comes. Amen? So that's the reason why I said, but now you have a choice. He said, which shall devour the adversary? But he said, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Right. Even though they had the law and you didn't want to listen to Moses, they died under two or three witnesses based on what they know. But here it is. Look at 29. Of... Um, how much sore punishment suppose ye, amen, shall ye be brought, thought worthy who have trodden under the foot the Son of God? You have taken what Christ has done, his death on the cross, his resurrection, him sending to the Father, making an intercession for you, you make it, and you live in a life like he, he didn't do nothing for you. He said you have trodden under his foot the Son of God. You, uh, you trampled on the blood of foot. He said, and have counted the blood of the covenant where which he sacrificed as an unholy thing. That's what people are doing. People here are continuing to live in there and want to do what they want. He was sanctified. He said, unholy thing and despised by the space of grace. Matter of fact, and Jesus even had a strong word for that. He tells us now, he tells us in Matthew 7, he says here, he says, judge not that ye shall not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with the measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdeth thy mote in thy brother's eye, but consider the beam that is on thine eye? In other words, you're spending your time 
but in judgment saying, look at them, what they're doing, but yet you're doing the same thing. And by you just being on judgment, you're just as guilty. But remember, you're either a reckless sinner living that life, or you're a respectable sinner. You don't do something in public, you're doing it when people don't see it. You're still a sinner. You still need to put your faith in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Which brings me to the second point, and this is where I'm going to stop tonight, is Paul said not only that you're going to be dealt with for uh, the knowledge that you have of God's word, but another one is by truth. By truth. Here, and he tells us the truth here, and he explains us what it is. He says in Romans 2, verses th 2 and 3, But we are sure that the judgment God is according to truth against them who commit such things. What's truth? The word of God. We know Jesus said, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No man coming to the Father by me. So you're going to have to accept the truth as who it is. The truth is Jesus Christ. Amen? He said, but we are sure that judgment of God is according to the truth against them who commit such things. The truth within God's word. God's written word. Amen? He said, and then verse 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them would do such things, and doeth the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? In other words, you may not be doing it out in the street, but you're doing it in the secret with nobody else knowing. You're going to be judged too. You're not getting out of it. You're going to be held accountable too for what you have done. This verse, there is no partiality with God. Both Jew and Gentile, or whether it's like saying here, saved and unsaved, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I made this plain last time, last week. You as a, a Christian, and if you live in the sin and you start, then I'm not saying that it's okay to go out and sin, but you're going to be held accountable. The Bible says we're going to all stand before the what? The judgment seat of Christ, talking to us as Christians. You're going to be able to account for the things that you've done in the body, whether it was good or evil. Amen. That's the beam of seat of Christ. But those who rightfully and continue to live that life and never accept Jesus Christ, they're going to come that fiery indignation that they talked about. They're going to be cast into the lake of fire. They're going to be experience the eternal wrath of God, a total separation. That's why he said, Thinkest thou, O this, O man, that thou judge them that which such do such thing and do it the same, that thou escape the judgment of God? You're going to, if you sit in judgment on somebody, you're going to be held accountable. Only way out is through Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, how shall we escape such greater salvation, greater salvation, which was spoke, first spoken to us by the prophets and was uh, confirmed to us by his son? Amen? So, this, this is why it's so many of, of us are here. There are the sins in the flesh and that we ought to deal with it ourselves. Christ has done his part. Once you say, you ought to deal with the sin in your life. Amen? So Paul was making the point here, whether you're a reckless sinner or whether you're a respectable sinner, you're still a what? Sinner that you need to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And this is what he is saying here. And if you're sitting in the church bringing on judgment on people, you're going to be held accountable. Amen. Don't think you're escaping. Here. And if you got sin in your life, you need to deal with it. This is what he said. And this is speaking to us as believers. Having therefore these promises. What promises? All the things that Christ has done for us justification, sanctification, glorification, forgiveness of sin, the giving of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, our temple being the Holy Spirit, uh, the body of the Holy Spirit. Amen. They say, having these promises that God is dearly beloved means he's talking to saved folks here. Here's what you and I need to do so that we have missed the judgment of God. And we here he said, let us cleanse ourselves. Don't wait for Christ to do it. You need to stop doing it yourself. From all filthiness of the flesh, and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In other words, if you are saved today, amen, you're, you don't have a depraved mind. That's why I said a believer cannot have a depraved mind because we have the mind of Christ. We have, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. But sometimes we fall into sin and sometimes a sinful habit. And we're living in it. But you need to come to the point that you need to cleanse yourself. You need to stop sinning. You have the power. Don't stop saying, I got the kind of help. That's, that's me, how I am. No. Christ delivered you from just who you are. Any man, any woman, any child be in Christ. He's a what? New creature. All old things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. There's a new ch sheriff in town, and his name is the Holy Spirit. And he lives and he dwells with inside of you. You can stop sinning if you want to. 
And if you can live in sin and don't feel guilty, then, then you say, you're just illegitimate. You're none of his. That's the reason why you be held accountable to your knowledge that you have and also to the truth of Scripture. I like what the ESV, and I'm going to close with this, it says here, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So when these Jews were condemning the Gentiles, they were really condemning themselves. And so it is as we as Christians sit there and bring judgment on other folk. You're condemning yourself. If you see a brother and sister or somebody out there, I'm not saying a brother and sister, or people out there who live in a riotous life in a sin, what we should need to do to them, this should burden our heart to the point that we do what he tells us. Go into all world. What? Preaching the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, the burial. Let them know that God loved them. They don't have to live that way. Christ died for them. Amen. And he loves them. Let them know that. But when you judge them, look at them, let them go to hell that way, you bring in judgment on yourself. It's like when you point your finger at someone else, there is three fingers pointing back at you. So just as much as you're trying to judge them, there's three fingers touching to you, and one going up to God, meaning you're going to be held accountable to it. So God bless you guys. Keep you tonight. We're going to talk about this more uh, next week when we talk about these here. But we need to realize that here, whether you are a reckless sinner or a respectable sinner. And we'll talk about it next week, what we call a religious sinner. There are people, we all have in common, they're sinners. And the only way out is through Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember what he said to John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God. What did he come? To take away the sins of the whole world. The only way that something can separate us from the Christ is our sin. But if you don't accept Jesus Christ and you continue to live that way, that means that you go subject to the wrath of God. God bless you, God. Keep you as my prayer. I pray that something was said tonight that helped you, or even us that that's saved, to remind us that we need to be living a life worthy of the vocation or the life that God has called us to. And what he has called us to a life of holiness. Amen. Striving to be more like Christ. Amen. And if you, you can't be like Christ and continue to live in sin, you need to find your place in the place of repentance. And if you don't repent and you want to justify your sin, you know, I have people who, who are sitting in churches and living in a lifestyle of where it is and they don't want to pray for it. Chances are you may not know Christ. Because if you can live that and you're not experiencing the judgment of Christ, he says that you're none of his. Because those he loves, he disciplines. And remember, there's a difference between the discipline of the Lord and his punishment. The punishment is the wrath of God, which means that God will give you over. God bless you. God keep you. I love you. Pray that you'll pray for me and I'll be praying for you. Come with us next. Be with us next week and see you on Sunday morning. Remember, you can come and worship with us at 239 West Washington Place. Our service starts at 830 on Sunday mornings. We're usually there, out of there by 945, 10 o'clock. We're out. And for those football fans, you have enough time to watch the Rams play. So God bless you. God keep you. Pray for me and I will pray for you. Have a blessed week.